today. Uh, Lady Sharice is here. She is uh, actually doing our children's ministry this uh, morning. So uh, hopefully you, some of you all will get a chance to see her uh, after service if you so like. Uh, but thank God for her and uh, all of the folks that are leading in that way. Uh, now we are continuing on in our on-ramps series, uh, continuing to uh, really thank God for the gift of this journey that we are all undertaking, but always appreciating that there are some on-ramps, some uh, pathways, some uh, uh, journey, part of our journey that is always in need of God uh, interjecting God's self. Amen. And uh, so we are certainly last week we had a powerful sermon preached by Pastor Tanisha on merging. Amen. And it was indeed a great blessing. And I hope that all of you who are terrible drivers took note of her uh, uh, her good uh, skills that she was trying to communicate, uh, even in the natural. Amen? Amen. I, I thought it was all very powerful. Uh, but just this idea that we are always trying to merge our lives uh, with the will of God. And sometimes that merging process can indeed feel a little bit uh, difficult and stressful. Uh, but I do believe that there is a great opportunity for all of us to actually do some uh, merging work. Now, uh, some of us need to always appreciate that some of the merging work that has to happen can only happen in uh, disciplines. We talked about prayer, but I also want to lift up that uh, we do have a season where we gather on the first Saturdays of every month to worship God here together. It's called Worship at the Way. So if you're trying to merge your will with God's will, one way is to pray. Certainly another way is to fast and read God's word, but I also think if you take advantage of worship at the way, uh, happening every first Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m., I think you'll find your own will and God's will actually merging a lot more powerfully. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, let's worship at the way. All right, that's on the first Saturdays of the month. Now, today we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, really taking a look, uh, continuing in our journey on this series around on-ramps, and also what does it mean for us to live in a post-resurrected uh, world, a world where we are certainly aware of the work that Jesus did on the cross. Turn with me in your Bibles then to first Romans chapter, not Romans, Lord, help me today. Acts chapter 11. Y'all, pray my strength. I've been running my mouth all week long. And I'm tired of hearing myself talk. Amen. So y'all pray that the Lord will speak. Amen. Because this McBride don't know what he's talking about half the time. Amen. But Acts chapter number 11, uh, we will uh, take a look at this particular uh, important figure, uh, Brother Paul uh, Peter, uh, who is indeed uh, making a, a powerful expression of his own faith journey. Peter was one of the folks that, uh, if you remember, denied Jesus three times and uh, told everybody what he was and wasn't going to do and on and on and on. And, and uh, Jesus kept giving Peter an opportunity to get it right. And uh, now we see Peter being uh, used in a real powerful way in the Church of Jerusalem. Uh, the book of Acts is an important uh, historical uh, account of the early church. Those who immediately, in the immediate aftermath of the resurrection of Jesus, what did they do? The days and weeks and months and years directly after they experienced the resurrection of Jesus, we find something very powerful uh, unfolding in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of those who were indeed following Jesus post-resurrection. And it, it should underscore at least a couple things. Number one, if you are following Jesus, you should have some acts, actions that follow. Hello, somebody. Amen. You can't follow Jesus with no actions. Now, it doesn't mean that your salvation is secured by your works. It just means that, uh, you know, uh, like so, for instance, some of you will be cheering for the warriors a little bit later on. Amen. And it is an outgrowth of your admiration for the warriors 
that you will probably be hollering and screaming and rolling on the floor and swinging from your chandelier and crying if they lose and celebrating if they win. Uh, but those actions are not what make you a warrior fan. You are a warrior fan and those actions are a direct result of your fanaticism. Hello, somebody. So in the same way, uh, these actions, they are not uh, what define or uh, secure your salvation, but they should indeed be great evidence that you are indeed following the ways of Jesus. And then the Acts also teach us that these actions must happen in community. So any of us who would dare to believe that you can follow Jesus and not live in community are not following the Bible. Mm-hmm. Amen. So, with that, our next topic for our on-ramp series will be detours. All right? How do you deal with detours? Detours. Detours. How many have ever dealt with a detour? How many find detours to be somewhat obnoxious, somewhat, especially when you weren't expecting the detour? All right? So, let's see what the scriptures uh, lift up for us today. All right, uh, Acts 11, chapter 1 through 18. It should be in your uh, uh, Bible as well, but on the screen. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Sorry for all you vegetarians in the house, amen, but you know, just try to ride along with the story, amen. Verse number eight, but I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them, not to make a distinction between them and us. It's a powerful statement, hmm? These six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house said, send to Joppa, bring Simon who was called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire house will be saved. Verse 15, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord. How he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? Woo! My Atlanta. When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praise God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk about uh, dealing with detours. Bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Now, it's important to appreciate a couple of things. The scripture says very boldly that there is a way that seems right unto us. But the end is destruction. 
And although you and I are people of great agency and intellect, great resilience, we all have uh, within our hearts and minds a way that we are instinctually wanting to go. How many of you know that there are times that you following your own directions can often have you closer to a problem? than the solution you were seeking. It is clear to me, at least, that uh, my ego, my, my, my uh, hubris, uh, dare I say, my uh, narcissistic uh, tendencies at times can cause me to uh, block out good direction, especially when it's coming from people I don't like. Uh-huh. Don't you know, you, you certain people, boy, you happy to take a direction from them, but then there's some folk you just like, mm, I know what you're telling me is right, but I'm going to do it my own way anyway. Hello, somebody. I have found that if we're serious about understanding how we should deal with detours, we must first appreciate that our way is not always the right way. And sometimes you and I can be on this journey of life and we are certainly gifted with experience, we're gifted with ideas, we're gifted with all kinds of things, uh, but I also believe that we are gifted with direction from God that will at times be mediated to us in many different kinds of ways. Sometimes you will get direction from God from people who are very much spiritual and, and wise and have great wisdom. And when that direction comes, you should hold it and grasp it. Even if you don't fully understand it, you should just kind of chalk it up, store it up for a rainy day. Sometimes you're going to get good direction from uh, people in your Christian community, folks that you're hopefully in live group and in relationships with. And sometimes you won't fully understand it, but you should, I believe, try and figure out and discern, Lord, is this the right direction for my season of life? Sometimes you're going to get direction in your times of prayer and study and you're really going to feel impressed from God uh, that this is a, a, a way for you to go. And, and it's going to feel very countercultural. It's going to feel very counterintuitive. But sometimes when you really know and believe it's from God and, 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 and then you talk to some others and they're able to help affirm and, and even enlighten it a little bit more, you should grab a hold of that and not easily let it go. All of these different kinds of ways that I believe God seeks to divinely interrupt our journey so we don't keep moving in the direction of danger or harm even when we can't see the danger or harm in front of us. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that God loves us enough to not, you know, uh, make us all graduate from the school of hard knocks in order to get, you know, those degrees we need to be successful. Some of these uh, lessons, I hope I can learn from some folk who've been through a few things and uh, maybe even, uh, you know, some of the notes that have been left here and there, some of the signs that will help me be able to deal with all the detours that come my way way. In the book of Acts, you see there is a very powerful expression of this new emerging following of the way. That's what they called themselves. They called themselves followers of the way. And this way was the way of Jesus. And they were in a culture that was totally against and resistant to this emerging way of life. And it was causing great tension. It was causing great amounts of conflict and part of what I have found often is that when you are attempting to follow the ways of Jesus particularly the radical claims that Jesus makes with his own words and his life because let's be clear uh, if there are you know a few things that distinguish Jesus from everybody else at least one of them is he was dead one day and then he was alive 
the next. Amen. Not too many of those folk kind of running around. Amen. I mean, I know we got the walking dead and all that kind of stuff and zombies, but Jesus was even better than the zombie. Amen. I mean, Jesus was like not just, you know, walking around limping and, and, and groaning and, and unintelligible and scaring the everything out of you. Jesus was actually like a better upgraded version of himself before he died. Now think about that for a second. Because Jesus was kind of pretty good when he died. I mean, he was walking on water, feeding folk with little bits of food, healing the sick. Jesus was kind of a pretty good version and then he arose from the dead as a better version of who he was when he died. Whew, that's some good little hope for some of us, amen. Because I know some of you think you're a pretty good version of yourself. Mm -hmm. But could you believe that there's a resurrection that God wants to do in your life? That may even upgrade you, upgrade us, position us for a better, more powerful impact in the service of God in the world. I don't know, this is not one of my points, but you ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him, Lord, help me get an upgrade. Amen. Help me get an upgrade. And, 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 and when I get upgraded, help me to be a blessing with my upgrade. Help me not just be walking around like, you know, popping the collar because I got an upgrade. Amen. Because that's not a better version of yourself. You can pop your collar without your upgrade. But could it be that sometimes these detours are intended to help make clear in your life the way God is moving? I think there are three kinds of detours just in general that uh, we ought to always be mindful of. Not necessarily as a, 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 a thing to totally get you off track, but certainly as a sign that God is trying to get your attention. Get you away from danger or help you to be okay with the powerful work that God is doing that you always can't even see with your own eyes. So the three things we'll talk about today, collisions, construction, and circumstances. Three kinds of detours that I think are going to be important for us to wrestle with today. First one is collisions. Everybody say collisions. Now, it's important to appreciate that when you and I are attempting to do life according to the way of Jesus, we will often be detoured by collisions, conflicts, these things that, that will put us at odds with ourselves and or others. Now, in this passage of scripture, we are clearly seeing that Peter who again was not one of the most conflict-free folk in Jesus' group. Peter is one of these folk who seem to like to fight and cuss and, you know, <laughs> you know, talk real big about what he was going to do and what he wasn't going to do. So have no fear, all you fighters, cussers, and braggers. Amen. Jesus still has at least one seat on the bus for you. Hello, somebody. But often, if you are engaging in life, how many of you know when you're driving and there is a collision, it is rarely your fault? <laughs> Amen. Some of us like, my insurance policy don't tell me that. Amen. Are you with insurance policies that match your car note? Praise God. To kind of let you know that some of these collisions may not be all your or all the other person's fault. But for the sake of this point, we'll say that some of these collisions, some of these things that create detours are often a result of other people's misleading thoughts, ideas, or information. Sometimes conflicts are really about other people's biases, prejudices, prejudices, or prejudices, or maybe it's not even plural, it's just prejudice. <laughs> biases and prejudice. I see the educators like, yes, pastor, yes. 
Y'all help me. Sharice ain't here today to correct me over there. Sometimes these collisions are about other folks' dysfunctions that are running headlong into the path that God has ordained us to actually realize. Now, I'm going to start broad and then I may come down narrow, but I need to always include some kind of talk about the many ways in which we are living in a world that is often dominated by what we call in our drug and alcohol uh, 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 field when we're doing counseling and the, the 12 steps. We call it stinky thinking. Any stinking thinking folks out there, amen. At least you, yeah, all right, thank God for the few of y'all, amen. I know I'm in the right place. Sometimes we are dealing with detours because other folks believe the wrong things about us. Now clearly, living in this country, living in this fallen world, we should all be clear that if we were to take this country's opinion about who we all should be. Whether you black, white, brown, red, indigenous, whatever kind of cultural, or if we took this country's narrow vision of who we should be, we would all be diminished. Because this country's narrative about who we are is much smaller than God's great declaration of who he created us to be. And you and I will often be caught in a collision with God's great idea and the world's small concepts. Hello, somebody. You and I will often be caught up in how we are called to live our lives in light of what God has told us we are versus how the world tries to remind us we are not. Part of what I want you to appreciate is that there is often all kinds of things in this world that will cause collisions and they will be about other people's stinky thinking. And it could detour you if you are not careful. It could detour us. It could cause you and I to buy into a inferior narrative about our purpose, our people, our assignment, rather than being fully grounded in who God calls us to be. The verse I pulled out that I think at least gestures at this is Peter is in Jerusalem and the circumcised believers criticize Peter. How you know you're always going to have some haters out there? Individual haters and systemic haters. Amen. The systemic haters are the folks that will always try to, you know, treat you and I with harsh, punitive uh, 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 consequences. As if we're the only folk that ever make these mistakes. Ain't that something? That folks are more hard on you than they would be on themselves. Mm-hmm. There is often within, I think, humanity a weakness to show grace to others, even if you are not fully aware of what other folks are struggling with or dealing with. What are they criticizing Peter about? Well, in this particular story and passage, or at least era, the first Christian converts were all Jewish. And because they were all Jewish, they had a little bit of baggage from their Jewish culture that was about circumcision, a practice that most males had to go through in order for them to have a certain kind of level of cleanliness. Clean, yes. I'm telling y'all, got to pray for me today, amen. And because they were so big on circumcision as a way to be faithful as Jews to God's uh, uh, commands, they carried that unbeknownst to them into this new way experience with Jesus. Peter was kind of struggling with that himself, if you read a few passages ahead or before. And Peter had to have this really interesting kind of thing 
to get him a little freed up from all that drama. Now, the point though is, because Peter had had his detour before everybody else, he had to deal with folk who still were holding on to some of these old ideas. They were saying, Peter, how can you go out down there and eat with these folk? They eating birds and reptiles, stuff that you ain't supposed to eat because you're a Jew. Peter, how dare you? And Peter had to give them this long account of why and how he had been in many ways set free from such a limitation related to who he should be in relationship with. This is a very deep part of this sermon today because for many of us, some of the collisions that we will have to endure that may lead to a detour will be about how do we set ourselves free from the vestiges and baggage of a way of thinking and believing that is not grounded in God's way of thinking and believing but has been often imposed upon us through the systems and powers of this world. Or it may not even be the sisters and powers of this world. It may just be your family in them. Your mom in them. Your pop in them. You know, they did the best that they could, but you still walking around here with a lot of stinky thinking. Part of what I want to submit to you is there is an opportunity for you and I to be set free from these false assumptions that create collisions on your journey. I want you to think about what some of these false assumptions may be in your life. What are the lies that were told about us that we need to rebuke and cast out of our mind, our heart, and our person? What are the things that this system, this world, has said about you and I? Your family where we live, our gender, our color, our identities that may be contested in some places, but yet they are causing us to experience collisions. Could it be that God is trying to help you and I rethink and reimagine some of these ideas? This week is re-entry week all across the country. Reentry week, it's a time when uh, those who have uh, uh, been in jails and prisons have returned home. And it is an emphasis all across the country where people are now elevating their stories of not only their failures and successes, but what we as a society must do to help them re-enter well into our communities. It's an important consideration that you and I as followers of Jesus must take because sadly many of us have been a part of creating and reinforcing these conditions and narratives that make it uncomfortable for people to re-enter back into our communities if they have gotten convicted of crimes. And I want to say that being convicted of a crime or being in jail doesn't mean you're guilty. Hello, somebody. Now, there are some folk who, you know, fall outside the boundaries of the law and they are indeed in jail. Uh, but there are many folk also who are in jails and prisons and they have not even been convicted yet. Did you know that? Hello, somebody. A lot of folk in jail and prison haven't even been convicted of a crime. Just waiting on a trial. Hello, somebody. So sometimes we have to figure out what are the misconceptions we have. Because some of us just take what the world and this country and the police and the criminal justice system and even a preacher, we just take it too, 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 too seriously without doing our own kind of thought and reflection. But I want to submit to you today that there is always a dominating idea for the child of God that must trump every other idea. And that is what does God have to say about you and me? 
God did ha not have any struggles with the Gentiles. <laughs> did you know that? Even before Jesus came, God wasn't tripping off the Gentiles. Because you even had folk in the, in the Hebrew scriptures that were called God-fearers. Meaning they were already included in what God was doing. So it wasn't like God came to a revelation. Ooh, the Gentiles. They're good now. No, that was our stinky thinking. And when you can be set free from some stinking thinking, I think the collisions that you are going through or that you are maybe prone to experience may not be the ones that cause you to have the detour off of your journey, but maybe even be more clear about the journey God has you on. What is a question then that you should think about? What collisions are creating detours in our journey? Are there unjust systems or false narratives that are misleading us that we then must be willing to confront head on? It will cause a confrontation just like Peter had a confrontation with the circumcised believers. So again, this isn't a conflict happening outside of the, the, the body of the faithful. This is happening inside. How many know sometimes you're going to have some disagreements even inside your own family units? But the question is, can you have deep reflection so you can move past the collision? Amen? Second point that I think is important to lift up if we are going to be dealing with the detour as well is construction. Everybody say construction. So sometimes you'll be detoured or experiencing a detour because of a collision that is on the road, on your journey. How many know sometimes you will also have a detour because of construction? Often they have these signs that says, please excuse our progress. Everyone even seen that? That's the, that's the nice way of saying we making a big mess. And uh, I know that you are now, like your journey, your, your, your trip has been somewhat interrupted, inconvenienced. You know, I don't know if you like me. I always try to get to the airport as soon as they call my name to board. Like, I'm the kind of guy that will just, like, you know, sit at home until uh, my GPS tells me that uh, as soon as I arrive at the airport, I will be parking, and I fly so much that I pretty much know how long it takes to get from my door of the car to the gate. So I just be walking, and I just be like, and they be like, uh, uh, priority, and I just keep on walking right onto the plane. That's how I like to travel. I hate to be sitting there all day in the airport waiting on my plane to take off. But there are moments mm, 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 on my journey to the airport where there is construction and it causes traffic or it takes me off the well journey path to a path and a road not traveled. And this is kind of what happens also with some of these detours. How many of you know when construction is happening either on the road and there if I come a little locally even in your life, it can cause a detour. Peter, again, had to go through his own reconstruction. And that's okay again because we are a post-resurrected people. So that means that sometimes God does indeed have to put us back together, a better version of ourselves. And my prayer for all of us, particularly we who are already walking with Jesus, is that we don't get so sanctified, sanctimonious, full of ourselves that we don't think we are still a, hmm, we, we are uh, uh, being worked on. I was trying to say, say it more sophisticated and deep, but it just left my head. A work in progress. That's not as sophisticated and deep, but it's better than being worked on. Peter had to go through his own kind of reconstructive process with God. And what did God tell Peter? 
What God has made clean, you must not call profane. What kind of reconstruction must we all go through in order to not get ourselves too caught up with what we are used to calling things when God calls it something totally different? Peter, overdetermined by bad information, his cultural influence, the very limited ways that he thought about diet, about uh, other people, God had to rework Peter. Had to deprogram him. Mm -hmm. Untype or unhook all of these kinds of uh, 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 unconscious connections that Peter was assigning value to. God had to do something radical to get Peter to be doing and assigning and accomplishing the work God had for him. Where is God trying to deprogram you? God had to reprogram Peter. Put him on a new assignment. Peter thought, you know, he just gave his great sermon. 3,000 people came uh, to faith. You know, Peter probably thought, boy, I am. Whew, talk about a recovery plan. I, you know, was the scaredy cat. I denied Jesus. Jesus told me to feed his sheep. Now I'm out here. 3,000 people. I have found my calling. Then God tells Peter, hey, Gentiles. No, no, that's, that's not, I'm not doing that. God had to unprogram, deprogram Peter. Where in your life is God trying to work on you? Now, I have found that one of the best ways that God deprograms us, does his work in us, is through radical encounters with God. Peter had a vision. Peter had a trance. Peter had this encounter with God that was extraordinary. Why? Because the extraordinary encounter was necessary to override his programming. This is why the Pentecostal spiritual charismatic experiences and tradition is a very important thing for all of us to be open to. Because there are some things in your life that will not be reset without a radical encounter with Jesus. I'm not talking about the kind of encounter that you can still make sense of when you get in your car and you measuring it like a chemist in your mind. Ooh, that was just the right amount of time for that song in worship. I tell you, that just written. And Pastor, he preached 32 minutes and 37 seconds, and that was just what I needed. Oh, and I lifted my hands for about, you know, 45 seconds, and that 46 second, I felt a breakthrough. I'm not talking about the kind of stuff you can measure. I'm talking about something that will have you like for the rest of your life like I don't know what scripture it was but I do know this something happened to me on this day I, uh, I can't preach I can't memorize nothing but I remember this vision this is what Peter was having now this vision had to be some kind of vision for him to then go back to Jerusalem and stand up to all the folks that were hating on him. That's what the experience with God and God's spirit will do. It will put inside of you something that even when everything else is falling down, you still have this kernel of a truth in your experience that will carry you all the way through. So don't be closed off to the many ways that God may try and supernaturally invade your life. I know for some of us, that's, not, I mean, no, you know, I get it. You know, I get it because, you know, like God invading my life sounds pretty intrusive. It does. It does. But there are many things invading your life right now that you should be terrified about but some of us we just accept it oh yes I want to become a, a, a commodity in this capitalistic lazy fair uh, uh, country you should be terrified of that but you sure enough go take your last few little pennies you have 
and spend it on items you don't need at the expense of your present past and your future terrified God help me to be as open to your invasion your unsolicited interruption that will change my life help me to be open to being surprised to be sitting there looking at the warrior game and all of a sudden I am being compelled to enter into prayer and worship help me to be open to it Lord help me today you know because when you are open to the surprising work of God even that which feels like a detour can end up being a setup for your big blessing your big revelation your next big opportunity I know you laid out in your sickness but God while I'm laid out surprise me I'm going to keep going to the doctor. I'm going to keep going to therapy. But while I go, heal me of my depression. Heal me of my pains and my aches. Restore my marriage. Save my children. Do it for me, God. I know that we live in a corrupt world and a corrupt system. And these folk trying to put us six feet under. But while I go to the White House, God, help me to be open to your surprise. That these crazy folk going to do something besides talk me to death. Help me to be open to your surprise that these folk on my job actually going to do some work today. Help me to be open, God, that Pookie in the neighborhood will respond to my hand outreached for the umpteenth time. Help me to be open to your surprise. Help me not to get so, so intellectual in everything that I'm doing that I miss out on the divine surprise. Y'all excuse me, but this is preaching to me all by myself construction God is trying to reconstruct some of us because unfortunately life has set us up to be all kinds of things so rigid ain't that a trip that we can be so rigid when ain't nothing about our life rigid <laughs> wish I could talk to somebody in here what's the question is God initiating construction on your journey what is it that God is trying to change about you? It's a good question. No, I'm on my way. I got my own plan. All of a sudden, I'm in some traffic. God, are you trying to change something about me? Are you trying to do something in me that otherwise could not be done if you did not initiate some construction? Oh God, let me be open. Let me be open. Then the last thing, we're going to spend a few moments in prayer. Unforeseen circumstances. Detours can often be caused by unforeseen circumstances. Verse 17, Peter is telling him, listen, I didn't expect these folk was going to be filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. I didn't expect it. It wasn't like in my plan. They still Gentiles. I'm a Jew. But I just did what God told me to do. And there was an unforeseen circumstance that resulted. Some of us need to be mindful of the detours that happen that are not a result of things we plan. Peter said it powerfully. Who am I? <laughs> Who am I that I could hinder God? All that's saying is God's got a sovereign kind of plan that you're not going to probably be able to interrupt. God can interrupt you, no doubt. At least I hope you believe that. See, I found people that don't think God can interrupt them. I like to be kind of far away from them. <laughs> I'm not going to manage you, but I'm going to give you your space. I like to call this space between me and some folk as the God space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the God space. This is the space for God and you to get that worked out. 
And I'm not so far away that I can't get back close to you when, you know, you kind of lose your illusion. Hello, somebody. Some of y'all need to create some God space. Because mm -hmm. there's some unforeseen tragedies that are going to happen. None of us expected Prince to die this week. That thing was just a joke, boy. And you know, my parents, we grew up holding this course, so I didn't grow up listening to Prince. <laughs> Prince didn't shape my life <laughs> like all a lot of my friends. I came to Prince late in life. <laughs> Touch your neighbor, somebody. So mine was just shock. I was like, whoa. But some of my friends, I thought, man, they lost, they just, they were crying and putting these olds to Prince. He helped shake my everything. And I was like, man, that must have been some kind of relationship you had with Prince. I'm not trying to diminish it or make light of it. It was an unforeseen tragedy. Nobody knew Prince was dealing with all the stuff that he seemed to be dealing with in his physical body. I didn't know he was going to war with the record companies. Ain't it something that all these, these artists that seem to go to war with these record companies to get control of their cultural productions all of a sudden seem to just... I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I just... It just some just, just, just... It's a shock! And some of my friends, very close with Prince, very close with Prince, worked with Prince all on all these projects I didn't even know. He was texting me and telling me all the stuff that Prince was doing. And, and you, some of y'all may see Brother Van on, on CNN just, 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 just crushed. And I prayed for him and we spent a lot of time in prayer just trying to, he's crushed. Tragedies can happen. You don't even expect it. Some of us go to the doctor thinking we're fully healthy and come home with a bad diagnosis. You sit there like, what in the world is going on? And then even the tragedies that you can expect. You know that you, your, your loved one is ill and, and, and they're having problems at school or on their job. And you kind of see the handwriting on the wall, but when the shoe drops, circumstances can cause you and I to have a detour. I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that even in these unforeseen tragedies and circumstances, God is still at work. God is still working to accomplish a perfect plan in your life. And you cannot allow your circumstances to cause you to be derailed from the journey that God has you on. Cry your tears. Get the therapy you need. Take time to grieve and heal and recover. That's probably what the detour is for. Because some of us, we're so used to just, I'm just going to keep going, kind of like Florida in, 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 in uh, good times, you know? When, when, you know, James died and she, she just wasn't, you know, acting like it wasn't a big deal. Everybody like, Mama, you got to cry. She's like, I'm not going to cry. I'm okay. I'm a cook and I'm a, I'm a queen. I'm doing all this stuff. And then at the end, she was like, dang, dang, dang. <laughs> some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you just break because you don't give yourself the time you need to deal with the unforeseen circumstance. I don't like unforeseen circumstances. I don't like unforeseen tragedies. I don't like things to happen that I'm not prepared for. My years of pastoring, there's so many things that have happened I was not prepared for. I remember when I got the call to have to bury one of my teenagers. I just seen him. I wasn't prepared for that. Remember when Sarai was sick and hospitalized, losing weight, shrinking. I gave, we gave birth to Sarai. She was a nice, healthy kid, and we watched her shrink half her size. I wasn't prepared for that. Remember when I went to the doctor and I thought I was healthy? They told me, McBride, you got a few problems. Wasn't prepared for that. And I got beat up by the cops. Wasn't prepared for that. Shoot, when I got to go to meet at the White House. Sure enough, wasn't prepared for that, and I'm still not. 
tragedies, circumstances, don't allow them to detour you off of the path that God has you on. Stay the course. God is more faithful than your circumstances. God will see you through it. God will see you through it. You may not know where help is coming. You may not know how help is coming. You may not know who your help's going to be. But God, God will give you what you need when you need it. Stand with me, everyone. Let's ask God to help us with these detours.